Ukraine's defense against Russia is being supported by billions of dollars in military aid from NATO countries. The Biden administration has so far authorized 2.6 billion in security assistance since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. During the entirety of the Biden administration, it's been about 3.2 billion. One of the most effective and expensive weapon systems supplied is the FGM-148 Javelin. The Javelin is co-manufactured between Lockheed Martin and Raytheon, and it is a portable anti-armor system. This means the Javelin is designed to take out hard targets like modern tanks and armored personnel carriers, or APCs. At a cost of close to $176,000 per system, the Javelin is not a cheap weapon of war. It also uses many high-tech components, which means that it takes time to make new ones. So the stated sort of maximum production capacity per annum is about 6,800 missiles. We think that basically the U.S. has sent over 7,000 missiles of its own stocks. So the U.S. has now exceeded the amount of, uh, of missiles that they can replenish in a year. The biggest challenge for the industrial base will be in gearing up to replace the weapons that the U.S. is supplying to Ukraine. What is the Javelin? How has the Ukrainian military used it? And can the U.S. keep up with demand for not just Ukraine, but for the U.S. military and other allies who want to buy this versatile weapons system? The U.S. has been providing weapons and training to Ukraine for years, and once Russia invaded, the U.S. and allies went all in to resupply the Ukrainian military. So to date, the U.S. has transferred more than 5,500 javelins into the theater in Ukraine because it's proving to be a highly effective weapon system on the battlefield. The aid is now flowing, uh, particularly anti-tank. Uh, I would put it in the category of uh, sufficient now arriving too late. Much of that, I think, should have been there last year as the buildup began. I visited Ukraine last year and the Ukrainians their Special Operations Command, their advisors, American Green Beret advisors, uh, were practically begging for more. The cost-benefit analysis of a Javelin versus a tank, Javelins aren't cheap by, you know, as, as they go. You're looking at about 200 grand, right, for a missile and a, and a CLU, but you're looking at several million for a tank. It's a cheaper weapon that destroys a much more expensive platform. Although Ukraine has managed to hold off Russian forces in key areas, the war is likely far from over. Russian forces in the southeast of Ukraine have embarked on a new offensive. This includes forces that were previously positioned near the capital, but were pulled back and repositioned to support this new push by Russia. The terrain in the east is, is a lot more open. There's, there'll be less emphasis on like small or light infantry ambushes of Russian columns in cities and sort of like wooded areas, and more sort of open terrain artillery duels. Um, you know, the weather's, the weather's getting nicer, the mud is drying, which means cross country, cross country mobility will be restored. In the east, it is what we would call in the military tank country wide open, rolling plains, uh, where you're going to need longer range, heavier systems. And that's why me and, and many others have been demanding the Biden administration send more sophisticated weaponry and send it faster. The first idea for the Javelin was pushed out in a memo in 1983. The concept, which took over a decade to develop, was to make an anti-tank missile that could be guided by infrared and had the ability to do a top-down attack on the lightly armored areas of Soviet armor. Once you get a lock uh, through the, through the um, what they call the clue, which is basically the operating system, once you get a lock onto the tank uh, and then fire the missile, you can seek cover. Uh, the previous systems, had a wire that, that unspooled behind the missile and you had to stay locked on the tank the entire time uh, that the missile was traveling. The sort of top attack or lofted flight, as it's sometimes referred to, uh, which is sort of like, you know, the curve, uh, the curve flight where the missile takes a steep launch trajectory, flies for a sort of, a sort of level for a while and then sort of dives onto the target. The effectiveness of these weapons has also shown a light on the processes needed to create them. We don't know where and when the next kinetic war will be, and producing new weapons, surging production lines takes time. The U.S. has so far provided a pretty substantial number of javelins, for example, to Ukraine. And uh, this may be a time where we might want to think about how we invest in increasing the inventory of uh, precision-guided weapons and other weapons and missiles. 
taking javelins from the existing US inventory depletes American stockpiles of these high-tech weapons. For every javelin that gets shipped out, it is one less that can be used for training or for war. So eventually, NATO members, as well as United States, are going to have to turn to defense industry to resupply their own arsenals. For a lot of these weapon systems, but especially for Javelin, the production lines have been designed to produce the number of systems that DOD and its partners plan to buy in, a, in an efficient way. Replacing them will require a manufacturing surge, which must be carefully managed and may not happen overnight. Both Lockheed Martin and Raytheon have seen boosts to their stock prices since the invasion. On February 15th, Lockheed was at $382 per share, and as of April 28th was at $441 per share. Raytheon was at around $94 per share on February February 15th, and as of April 28th is at $98 per share. Look, I think we can take some risk here uh, in providing the Ukrainians as fast as possible and then over time refilling our own stocks. And something else to keep in mind is that it often takes a long time to get military contracts approved as well as the production of these types of specialized weapons. The future of Ukraine remains murky, but how the Ukrainian military uses the billions in aid could be a big factor in the eventual outcome. The, the, the simple presence, the vast number of these, of these weapons give the Ukrainians options. It's a fact that the Russians have to factor in as well. You know, if I was a Russian tank crew, the amount of anti-tank weapons in that country would probably make me have sleepless nights. Russia's invasion has rattled the world order. Other hotspots could develop that would require the US military to have ample amounts of high-tech weapons to either use for its own purposes or to give to a partner country. This may be a time where we might want to think about how we invest in increasing the inventory of uh, precision-guided weapons and other weapons and missiles. Every missile you buy may mean, you know, less money for training, less money for research and development for exciting new technologies. So there are a lot of budget trade-offs to consider. As for the Javelin's battlefield performance, it may be some time until hard data emerges about how effective it has been in Ukraine, but there could be ways the U.S. government could help the Ukrainians employ them better today. We don't have folks on the ground, uh, and I think that is a policy decision that we should reconsider, uh, you know, that we could do so covertly, uh, and we could do so with small numbers of intelligence officers and special operators to actually get out there advise, operate, even not necessarily in the very front line, but perhaps in the command and control and headquarters level uh, to get visibility on how effectively the Ukrainians are employing the systems, help them uh, with, with the operational knowledge. It's, I think we could help them be actually more effective if we had advisors alongside, but we'd have to do that in very small numbers, very selectively and very quietly.